Welcome to the Power in Motion podcast, the show for women who want to develop a kinder relationship with their body so you can feel healthy, happy, and confident without restricting food, doing torturous exercise, or constantly worrying about the number on the scale. I'm your host, Kim Hagel, size inclusive fitness specialist and certified non diet health and life coach specializing in body image. This podcast is here to provide weight neutral, health at every size aligned information and coaching on sustainable habits and mindset shifts so you can feel your very best in the body you have right now. Let's lace up our runners and go for a walk while we chat. Well, hello, friends. So at the time of this recording, it's mid-August 2021, and we've just finished the 2020 Tokyo Summer Olympics. Uh, They did take place, of course, in 2021, but with the pandemic, they were delayed from last year. So hence, we're still calling them the 2020 Tokyo Summer Olympics. And of course, I love to watch the Olympics and cheer on our Canadian athletes. I'm always so inspired by the dedication, athleticism, and passion they put into their sport. And as I was watching, it got me thinking about competition and the intersection between competition and joyful movement, or can they even intersect? I know for myself and many of my peers and the women that I've worked with, competition can be a really slippery slope. Some people seem to thrive on it and love competing no matter the result, and for others, it can really steal all the joy from the sport. So as I was thinking about this whole idea and examining my own thoughts about competition, I wondered how the Olympic athletes manage those thoughts and maintain a sense of self while competing at such a high level. Well, I've got a very special guest on the show today, and I'm kind of having a little fangirl moment, if truth be told. So those of you who live near me in Midwestern Ontario will be very familiar with this person, and the rest of you will definitely be inspired by her story. Julianne Stelly is a 5,000 meter runner from Lucknow, Ontario, who just competed in the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. She went to Queen's University for a Bachelor of Arts Honours and Master of Science in Health Studies and Sport Psychology. She recently finished her education with a teaching degree from Western University this past spring. She's going to put her career on hold for the time being and focus on training leading into the Paris 2024 Summer Olympics. I've been following Julianne's Olympic journey, of course. Living in rural Ontario, it's not every day we have a local athlete go to the Olympics. And I'll tell you, the thing that inspired me most as I watched her was how happy she appeared through the whole process. So I was really curious to sit down and chat with her about her Olympic experience and how she maintained her joy for running while competing at such a high level. In our interview, Julianne shared some really inspiring tips about how she sets goals and challenges herself while managing her mindset and her sense of self. I know that our hometown community is so proud of Julianne, and it's truly an honor to have the chance to sit and chat with her on this show. So without any further ado, let's hear from Julianne Staley. Welcome to the Joyful Movement show, Julianne. I am so honored to have you here today. I mean, it's not every day that I get to sit down and chat with an Olympic athlete. In fact, I think this is maybe the first time. So it's a great privilege to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Pleasure. Well, first of all, holy cow, congratulations on your Olympic debut. I loved watching your journey leading up to and during the Tokyo 2020 Summer Olympics. And I know I can speak for all of us here in your hometown community that we were all cheering you on from afar and we are so proud of you and your performance. And I kind of can't wait to get into all the details, but how do you feel right now having just come back? Yeah, it's definitely kind of a whirlwind um, from leaving for Japan and and getting back home again. And I think it's, I took as much of the experience in as I could. And um, just knowing that it was going to be very different once I came home and kind of sort of back to real life is, is what it feels like. But um, yeah, I can't, I can't speak highly enough of just the whole um, experience and all the people that I met and just making my Olympic debut um, and all the support when I came back home. Amazing. So before we kind of unpack all of that, um, I have a question that I like to ask all of the guests that I have here on the Joyful Movement show, which is, what does Joyful Movement mean to you? 
I think in the sense of running, um, just being in motion, I think uh, it's the time in the day where I can just be alone in my own thoughts and mm. just moving in your own body. And I think it is sort of this mind body experience too. It, I think once you're, once I'm out, once I'm running, it just feels like I'm sort of connected and, and that, you know, it's, it's no distraction and just, you know, focusing on how I feel in that. And a lot of people think about it as a sort of exertion and, mm. uh, you know, not a, not a more pleasurable experience, but I think at this level, um, it is almost, it's kind of like a, a meditative thing, at least for the easy days that I go out. The workouts are of course a different, um, challenge, but I do just enjoy the, the really, um, the essence of just running. I love that. That's always been my favorite part about running too. I mean, obviously I don't run at, at your level, but that's always been my favorite thing. And like you say, not every run is like that, but when we can find that connection to ourself and be in our body, there is something very meditative and, and freeing about, about the activity. Mm-hmm. So talk to me about your early running days. Like how did you get started in the sport and well, you shared what you love about running, but what first attracted you to competitive running? Yeah, growing up, um, kind of small town, rural area in Lucknow, um, you know, in elementary school, I played all sports growing up. So anything that was offered, I was signing up for. And I think just sort of a general background in, in enjoying activity and just being active. And then come high school, you had to start choosing between seasons and sports just because of overlap and timing. So mm-hmm. um I switched, you know, from a soccer, dance, sort of swimming background a little bit. I I let those activities go and just um, the cross country and, and track um, where I I led myself and in, into more competitive, but I was still doing other sports. And I think just having um, sort of an experience and in, in moving my body in different ways, I think that was just conducive to longevity in the sport and where I am now. Um, but I would say university is really when it took off in terms of, um, my competitive career. And just because then I was focusing on sort of, uh, full-time training and more of that elite level. Cool. So had you always had competing at Olymp at the Olympics as a goal or when did you start to think or know that might be possible for you? Yeah, I wouldn't say that I was like, you know, five years old watching the Olympics, dreaming about it. I don't think, you know, a lot of athletes will talk about that, that, you know, this is something they've thought about for their entire life. And I would say for me, it was probably more in the last um, five to 10 years. I think I made my first national team out of second year university, um, representing Canada um, at the FISU World Cross Country Championships. And there, I think the seed was sort of planted in terms of this, you know, what's what's after school and just, you know, possibilities in terms of growth and development in the sport. Um, and I remember watching the Rio Olympics thinking, you know, I might, I could have a shot at, you know, making that team. And I, I didn't. Um, but I think from from 2016 on in that five year time. I really just dedicated myself to the sport and um, it wasn't like I changed things up a lot, but I just, I sort of had this in the back of my mind that I wanted to see how far I could take it. And Mm -hmm. now having gone there and done that, it's like, okay, now let's see, you know, where we can go from here. Yeah. Now our listeners won't be able to see your face as you're talking, but you are just lighting up as you're talking about at continuing on and, uh, and carrying on your Olympic goals. So I'm curious, how, how do you set goals as a competitive athlete? Like, I think everybody kind of goes through a different process and sometimes we set goals for the wrong reasons, but seeing how inspired you are, I, I think you've maybe got a different mindset about goal setting. I'd love to hear about it. Yeah. I mean, nothing groundbreaking, you know, we talk about short-term, long-term goals and that's basically how you plan a season and, you know, what's, what's the eventual race that you want to go to. And for me, that was Tokyo. And then working back from there in terms of those, you know, smaller little goals in order to qualify, um, thinking of sort of my long-term development in the sport, I think what was so important for me is being in the moment and at the level of competition that I was in. So even in high school, I felt like I was always trying to maximize, you know, the, the stage of development that I was at. So 
for, for, you know, when I was at Medill, it was, you know, off so, so the provincial championships and having won that, I felt like, okay, you know, I've, I've done this and now what's next. And then looking at university, um, I ended up winning nationals there at the Canadian level. So it was just sort of this very stepwise progression. And I think it's important to, to not look too far ahead, you know, like mm-hmm. thinking about the games in, in high school would have been overwhelming. If someone had said like, you're going to make Tokyo, I think the pressure would have been, um, difficult to to deal with at that time but um just staying focused and sort of in that moment I think is is really important and you see that progression wherever you're at and um that is really um special because I think you know when you're when you're celebrating those accomplishments even though looking back it probably wasn't that big of a deal to win offset but at the time it was like winning the Olympics (laughs) yeah I think it's yeah, these these goals that you set, I mean, those expectations are so important in terms of your satisfaction. And I think it needs to be something that's within reach and then how you build from that, because it's never you're you know, you sh- you're never really satisfied because you're always, yeah. you know, reaching for something else. And that's the the most special part of it is, you know, even having competed at the at the highest stage, I, you could say of the sport, I now I can see there's something else on the other side. Yeah. So speaking of satisfaction, then where do you find your satisfaction in your goal setting? Like, is it in winning? Is it in achieving the outcome or is it in the journey itself of seeing what you're capable of? And the journey, like, absolutely. I think in my high school coaches sort of instilled that in me is that there's this sort of personal best approach. And in running, it's it's very literal in the sense that, you know, any time that you run faster than you ever have, that's a personal best. And sometimes, you know, it's just a few seconds and you're sort of disappointed, but I've always celebrated that. So anytime that I feel like there's, there's improvement, whether it's in a workout, I think that's something that you have to acknowledge and mm. you might never run any faster in your life. And there's no guarantees in the sport. So for me, looking at my whole season in, in 2021, it was I think the most special moment was just running under the qualifying standard when I went 1502 for the first time. And on paper, I mean, I went under 15 minutes a couple of weeks after, but that was still, I think, the biggest um, highlight just because of yeah. what that meant to me in that moment. And yeah, and Olympics are incredible, the whole experience. But uh, I, I don't think that um, the, the time on paper is necessarily what's going to make you most happy. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it is really about in the moment, um, celebrating that. And I think, yeah, you're, 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 as long as you're enjoying that, I think the success will follow. And I, I don't get too fixated on the outcome, even if the games weren't to have happened this summer, I was okay with that. But as long as I was enjoying what I was doing, I knew that whatever was the outcome, it would, it would be open. I love that because I think we can attach a lot of value to the outcome and the outcome on that particular day, especially. And as you say, like you might have your best, your personal best during a training run and, you know, it doesn't necessarily count for anything, but it's still a huge achievement. So what was your goal for the games? Did you have one going in? Yeah, being my first kind of debut into that level of competition, I knew that it was going to be a lot about just managing my emotion and being able to step on the line and just handle the, you know, I don't want to say pressure, but it is, you know, a, a whole other um, arena to be competing in. So I was 20th ranked going in, but with heat and the competition, I think I was really rolling the dice in terms of, you know, what was possible on that day. Um It was not my best performance, but it was the best I had on that day. And I think walking away from that track, I just knew there are a lot of things that I still want to explore and see in terms of just improvements and those little one percents as well. But um, enjoying the whole experience was definitely one of my top priorities, just because being your first games, you're never going to have that again. Um, Mm -hmm. Even for a lot of athletes that had gone to London or to Rio, it was a totally different approach that they had going in. And I think I just wanted to take it all in while still focusing on the performance. So I think I did that well, of course, you know, mm. being higher up in my heat and hopefully one day making the finals um, is definitely um, on the list. Yeah. 
Oh, amazing. I mean, that's certainly what I saw. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But I, it certainly seemed from the outside in that you were enjoying the whole experience. I, I definitely picked that vibe up. Before we talk about your actual race at the Olympics, let's talk about leading up to and your, your training prior to the Olympics, because I can only imagine that running at this level takes some pretty serious dedication and commitment. So what else was going on in your life while you were training? Were you holding another job? Or were you still in school? How did you balance it all? Yeah, so essentially for the last almost 10 years, um, I have been in school. So I was at Queens and then I um, just finished my teaching degree at Western um, this spring. So I've only ever known being sort of a student athlete and and balancing that with running, which I think works well because when you're not running, you're just resting. And I mean, you can be studying and reading during that time. So um, in 2021, it looked a little bit different because I still needed a qualification um, time and not having any um, results from 2020, essentially, because there were no races um, on the calendar, I mm. had about six months in terms of qualifications. So oh, wow. from December, 2020 until June, um, it was sort of this window of opportunity. And I just went down to the U S and I lined up a whole bunch of races and I mean, I could talk about it now, like it all had been, you know, sort of seamless, but at the time I was really nervous about that. And just with everything that else was going on and competing interests and, um, it was tough. And looking back, I think, you know, I have, I have no regrets, but um, planning during changing times and just being able to pivot and constantly, um, you know, the adaptability and just resilience and having confidence that, you know, it's going to work and you're making you know, a decision and having to commit to that. So I would say it was just, it worked out in the best way possible, but so much was out of my control. I'll bet. Yeah. Did, how did it affect relationships? Did you have people that were supporting you and like, getting, helping you through that? I'm sure very stressful time. Yeah. Luckily, like between my coach and strength trainer and us working with the sports, like actually that I had reached out to in February when things were feeling overwhelming and I just, you know, within sport and, and outside of sport as well, I think I just needed someone to sort of sit down with and really kind of hash it out in terms of, you know, what, what is my goal and how am I going to, you know, achieve this and what kind of mindset do I need going into this? Because there was so much else going around. And I think my approach was just, you know, am I distracted or am I focused and mm-hmm. what do I need to do to shift that? And a lot of it was sort of like this, negative energy and sort of nervousness and anxiety and switching that into this positive excitement and being fortunate to be able to step onto the line. And I knew, you know, I would put myself in the best position possible, but again, you, you have no control over a lot of different variables, but you have to just be okay with that, knowing everything that I'm doing, you know, if I put myself in the best position possible, if I'm doing all the preparation and work, then once I get to the line, it's just, I feel this almost sense of calmness, knowing I've done everything I can. And now this is just my chance to perform. So that was a big piece is working with um, Dr. Dean Tripp on that. Um, and then obviously my personal coach for training um, and then my family as well. I mean, they just, they were super excited and just watching my progression and uh, just being there every step of the way, although they couldn't physically be at the races to watch, but I knew that they were always watching and sharing. Oh, that's amazing. It sounds as though you had a really good handle on your mindset or maybe in those times where you didn't, you had the support to help you get back on track. Like I'm sure there were days where the emotions maybe got the better of you and you weren't loving your running so much. And it was, you were maybe questioning whether it was all worth it, but I love how you just always brought it back to what's important what, what, where are your priorities and what can you control? Right. And then reconnecting to that joy for the, for the activity that you've always felt. Yeah. Would you say that was like the big thing that got you through it? Yeah. I I mean, we talk about that a lot in, in running specifically, but I mean, when you step on that line, your fitness is not going to change. Like leading into a race, you know, you've done everything you can. You're, you've put yourself in that 
position. So the only thing that's really going to determine, you know, your outcome is your approach, your mindset and how you perceive sort of that challenge and how you're going to, you know, execute and just, um, you know, let your body, give yourself permission to go out there and just really put yourself on the line. So yeah. uh, that was really exciting just to see, I think, and it's a maturity thing as well. Once you've had experiences of running and racing a lot, and especially at a certain level, um, it becomes sort of routine and mm -hmm. you're able to just sort of channel in and, yeah. and uh, uh, lose, you know, the noise outside of yeah. it. I love that. Yeah, it's such a, a good skill to have, I think, for all of us, even in our day to day life to just be able to focus in on what what we really, really need to think about, what we're really prioritizing. Um, so, as I said before, something that I found really inspiring and just cool about you as I watched your whole journey before, during and after the games is how happy you really looked throughout the whole thing. And I really wanted to get into that with you. Because I think that sometimes competition can really suck the joy out of movement. I have certainly experienced that myself and I've seen it in lots of my peers and clients. So what would you say was your secret to staying happy and centered even while competing at such a high level? Yeah, that's a, it is a good question. I think, I mean, it can't be forced. I mean, your enjoyment at something has to be innate in terms of you you like doing what you're doing and I think that is really the key to success is like if if you're enjoying that journey it's you know success will follow and mm -hmm. for me I mean I love running and I think it really just stemmed from being grateful that I have this opportunity to go for it and I just count myself lucky because I saw other teammates and you know just people on the Olympic team who were constantly you know oscillating between their home life and their their professional life in sport and those sort of sacrifices that they were constantly making between um you know kids and family and you know fiancés and wedding plans and all these things that were you know competing with their time and feeling like if they were with their family they were you know missing out on training and if they were training they were missing out on that time spent with their loved ones so mm -hmm. i think that was a big piece is i didn't have this sort of um you know second part of my um I guess life happening without me so I I was really just in that moment in terms of focusing on running and and not having any sort of distraction that way um and I think the people that I met and just who I shared this experience with was a big part of mm. the whole enjoyment piece and I met maybe some of my best friends um and just having the support of um my people from the team at university. And I think that is what really um, makes it special knowing that you have all of those people in your corner. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing a lot of just gratitude as you talk. And you even said that. And I think you're, you're so right. Like gratitude, I think is like the precursor to joy. So if you can stay in that feeling of being so fortunate and and grateful and thankful for everything that you're able to do and all the opportunities that are are coming your way then how can you not feel happy and thrilled to be there and experiencing all of that so i know that sometimes competition can become this thing where we try to prove ourselves either to ourselves or to others and we can really like wrap our value up in how we perform um, I know like this is my story and it's what I've seen in, in clients too, along the way where like winning is equal to success. And then that means you're good enough, but anything less than that is failure. And by extension, then I'm a failure. Have you ever got trapped in that way of thinking? And if so, how do you manage that not good enough voice? How do you avoid tying your worth to your race results? Distinguishing between the two, I think, is one of the most important things you need to do. Um, no matter what uh, sport or profession you're in, I think you have to make sure that you have this sort of balance between who you are and what you do, um, because those are not, um, I guess, directly um, interlaced. I think you really need to have that sort of distinguishing um, piece. And I think my parents really were the ones that... Um, made that clear and I think no matter the times I run in the sport um, that does not determine my value as a person or my worth 
um, especially now looking ahead with contracts and and negotiating sort of you know sponsorships and of course there's there's value tied to you know mm-hmm. what you've done and and people are constantly you know there's this judgment of you know how good are you and how good will you be but mm-hmm. me I know who I am and especially outside of the sport as well and that is is really I think important especially for a lot of upcoming athletes or just those who are you know enjoying movement or fitness in any sort of way um you you have to sort of tease that apart and um it's it is tough and for such an objective sport where you have a list of names ranked in order with their times beside and who can really it's it's this it's this very um higher goal sort of uh yeah. you know comparison and you can you can you can really get too fixated on that um but i I think when I meet other people um, and other athletes, their times are really the least interesting thing about them. And I always look back to that is having been on Team Canada and and meeting, you know, these other hundred meter runners in the four by one team. And, you know, you get talking to them. You're like, wow, like you're, you're just a really great person. And like, I genuinely want to spend time with you. And I think that is, it's what's important is, you know, when you, you remember someone, it's, you know, they're successful, but, and I mean, I'll use Damien Warner as an example, but he's just, he embodies sport for way more than just the performance of it. And I think that is, is really key. Yeah. Oh, I love what you just said. Like that just really, I I felt shivers when you said that, because I know how easy it is to fall into that trap of like my time is equal to my success and therefore my worth. But you're right. Like when we think about these other people in our lives that we look up to and are inspired by and just love, do we think about how fast they are or what they like, how, how much they weigh or any of those other things we tend to tie our worth up in? Of course not. Right. We see the essence of them as a human being and that's who we are. It's not our time. I love that you have that mindset. So talk, walk me through your self-talk the day. Let's talk about the day of the, of the race. Walk me through what was going on in your mind. What were you saying to yourself when you woke up that morning, knowing that your heat was that day? Yeah. So we raced at um, 7 PM. So I did have a whole day to be, to be thinking about this. Um, but I think I was oscillating between sort of, this is the biggest race in my life. And this is just another 5,000 meter race. So 12 and a half laps on any other 400 meter track. It just happens to be one of the most beautiful stadiums that I'm probably going to run in. Um, but it it was sort of this excitement and then sort of bringing it back in and just sort of containing it and channeling it. And mm. um, luckily uh, we we're in uh, seven person suites. So we had um, roommates and people were sort of coming and going to the track. And I was able to um, chat with one of um, the girls who had actually been a former Olympian as well. And she had just said to me, she said, you know, when you enter that stadium, when you walk onto that track, she said, just take a moment to take it all in because mm-hmm. you're not going to remember much from that race, but you are going to remember your first experience of just walking into that track. And I'm oh. so happy I took that advice because, you know, once you're ushered in and you're like being rushed down this like endless corridor and you're ripping off your like warm up stuff and throwing on your spikes and it just sort of the time passes and the race and you know it's just sort of this like slurry so oh, well, that, that was an important piece and I just really wanted to feel that sort of you know support and I knew that there were so many people watching and uh, you really couldn't tell that there are still people in the stands as well. So it didn't feel like, you know, you were alone and Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, it was just a very special experience. And now having done that, I think you want to see what else you can do and what's possible. And, you know, you you definitely want to try and be one of the best. So no doubt, no doubt. So then I'm curious, what do you think about when you're running? Like when you're doing that 5,000 meter, 12 and a half laps, which by the way, you did in 15 minutes and 33 seconds. That's incredible. (laughs) Incredible. What are you thinking about for those 15-ish minutes? Yeah, I think this, the, my Olympic race was a lot different than any other race I had run that season, because now it's not really about you or your time. You're just getting in there and basically reacting to every move that's being made. Mm -hmm. Um, Prior to what I was doing is just 
chasing time. So you're really controlling your laps and your splits. And, you know, you're looking at the clock and fortunately 15 minutes for, for 5,000 meters is easy because at every kilometer you can see it's just three, six, uh, nine, 12, 15. So uh-huh. you, I can always see sort of where I'm at. And usually around 3K, I look and I think I split in 907. So I was just off of, you know, 15 minutes. I was running then 15, uh, 30 pace at that point. But um, it's it's kind of running within yourself, but not giving too much attention to, you know, that your legs are, you know, getting mm-hmm. heavy or mm-hmm. just being the heat as well to sort of just you're encapsulated into this moisture and and the, <laughs> sort of you you could feel your body just heating up and and yeah. I say, can I push or is this where I just have to sort of like settle in and hold but um it was tough and I mean the race was sort of ahead of me I was in my own heat almost and I could see you know the the, the lead pack was about 25 50 meters ahead and I was just thinking like do not you know ease up like just try and maintain that contact and mm-hmm. it was one of the hardest races because Mm -hmm. I think when things are going well and you're in it and you're, you know, able to really compete. I mean, that's who I am. I'm a racer. I'm not just a time trialer to go out by myself and run. So, um, it was, it was really difficult and, you know, being able to finish strong and just come into the line knowing, you know, you're just essentially pushing yourself at that point. But, Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was really, I think I'm proud of how I ran it. Um, but I certainly, would like to see what else I can do. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you feel after? Were you pleased with your performance? Um, I, I felt very mixed. It was, it was just sort of like, okay, now it's over. And yeah, I, I remember just like looking up at the scoreboard. And I just didn't want to step off the track because, you know, once you finish, then you're ushered into the media zone. And then from there you oh. go, you have to go grab your belongings. But knowing that I wouldn't be back. And I remember just walking away. Um, so I had my bag and I'm leaving the stadium and I'm just sort of looking over my shoulder and I'm thinking like, I'm not, I'm not going to be back on that line. And that I think was mm-hmm. the hardest part because it was sort of this once, hopefully not just once, maybe twice in a lifetime experience, but um, it's, it is short lived. And I think that's the best part of being at the games is, is competing. Um mm. But luckily, I think I had made a whole um, experience out of mm-hmm. out of everything outside of just that race. So overall, the performance I would say was a a very B plus. Um, but I think I I did everything that I could have, and that's the only yeah. um, thing that I can hold on to is knowing that on that day, that's what I had. Yeah. Oh, I mean. I, I just stand in awe. Like I, I, I can't even imagine, but I'm so inspired. Like, it's just inspiring to hear how you took that all in. And even before you left the track to just take that moment to appreciate what you accomplished. Yes. It's incredible. We're so proud of you. So I, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on the show and, and sharing so openly about your experience and you know that your hometown community and around the world, we're all super proud of you and we'll be watching as you as you carry on. I know you've said that this is just your Olympic debut. There's lots more for you. What's next? What do you have planned for your future? Fortunately, there's sort of lots in terms of the next three years um, towards Paris in 2024. Uh, there's a Worlds and Commonwealth Games in 2022 and then a Worlds in 2023 leading in. So um, I just really want to give myself that time. I'm 27 now. So looking ahead to sort of that three-year block till I'm 30, I think just focusing on running. And I've never had that where I just, you know, can can put everything else aside and just really um, give myself to the sport and see what's possible. But um, yeah, I, I think for me, it's it's just pushing myself and working on those little um, pieces. I think there's lots that I learned from this whole experience in terms of my sort of lack of, um, I guess, experience, but just also, um, there's, you know, a lot of little pieces in terms of improvement and, um, how you approach a race that I, that I took away from that. So, um, I'm just excited about that. And I just want to be able to feel like once, you know, I've, I've done this, that I've, 
I feel satisfied in that. And I can walk away knowing I've made the most of it. And, you know, that I'm not in my thirties wishing I had, you know, done more, but I think, you know, putting my teaching on hold, I can, I can do that for many years down the road, but I probably yeah. won't be running under 15 minutes um, later on. So, yeah. Great plan. Well, I know I'll be following along as you carry on your journey. And if any of our listeners want to, to stay in touch and keep following you, where can they find you? I have Instagram, I have Twitter, um, I have Facebook. It's all at J-A and my last name, Staly, S-T-A-E-H-L-I. Fantastic. And I'll link all of that in the show notes too, so that people can follow your journey. Well, thank you once again, Julianne, for coming on the Joyful Movement Show and sharing your story. It was an honor to chat with you and uh, I wish you all the best and continued success as you carry on with your running career. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Well, that's it for today. I think my biggest takeaway from all of this is remembering that who I am and what I do are not the same thing. I really love how Julianne maintains that mindset and hopefully her sharing has inspired you to reflect a little on where you're tying your worth. She's right, you know, in that your performance or your weight are the least interesting thing about you. And we can take joy in our activities and pride in our performance regardless of the outcome. Thanks from both Julianne and I so much for tuning in for this interview. I've linked all Julianne's social accounts in the show notes so you can go follow her. And of course, all my stuff's there as well. So feel free to connect with me on social or learn more about my programs on my website. We'll see you back here next Monday. And in the meantime, here's to your radiant vitality. Thanks for tuning into the Power in Motion podcast today. If you love what you're learning here, then I invite you to take the next step of embodying these concepts into your own life so that you can live your healthiest, happiest life and never again feel held back by your body. Coaching is the fastest, most efficient pathway to taking what you know in your head to actually applying it and seeing results. Whether you're looking to make changes around movement, food, body image, or all three, I'm here to help you nurture a kind, respectful and trusting relationship with your body so you can feel your very best. Click the link in the show notes to book a free consultation and together we'll uncover what's getting in the way of you having the results you want. You'll leave this call knowing exactly what you need to work on and together we'll explore whether one of my coaching offers is a good fit for you. I can't wait to meet you.